from a deep fabricated garden shed in Rockland County, New York, USA. This is Stand Up with Pete Dominic. On today's episode, how to identify the newly discovered species of dinosaur with all of that COVID brain fog. And now, the podcast host whose mind is as clear as a cannabis cabana lounge, Pete Dominic! <laughs> yes, sir, yes, indeed. Thank you, Pico. The mind is crystal clear. The thumb, however, has been mangled by a hedge trimmer. I was out cutting down the, uh, you know, the seeds, the grasses. We grow these these uh probably not indigenous to where i live like the reed grasses you know anyway i was using hedge clippers hedge trimmers the electric ones that i've got and i had gloves on and everything and i i literally grabbed the hedge trimmers with one hand and hit the trigger with the other hand luckily i had the gloves on it but it still cut through and mangled my thumb yesterday and so i'm all bandaged up there was a lot of blood loss but folks i'm brave and i'm tough and heroic i bandaged it up i went back out there and almost finished the job so don't don't cry for me argentina but do cry for argentina in the world cup if they don't advance into the next round that i will say I'm obsessed with soccer. I'm not afraid to admit it. I'm not a sports guy, but I am kind of a World Cup guy. And I know many of you aren't, but any of you who want to watch the game along with me, then I will put a Zoom link in and we can watch the U.S.-Iran game. And make sure you pronounce it that way or else they will yell at you, the Iranians. If anybody wants to watch the game with me, a few of us are going to have a Zoom Link, that was Maddie Carlson's idea. I'll establish that and put it in the subscriber email for tomorrow. The game is at 2 o'clock east. Again, if you're a subscriber, you want to watch the game along with a few of us, 2 p.m. east, we will watch it on Zoom together, and that should be fun because it'll be more fun than watching it alone, right? Okay, so join me there. Today, joining me on the show, it's CNBC's Ron Insana, like you've never heard him before. We get very personal, we have fun, we have a thoughtful conversation. I think you're really going to like this and learn a lot from it as well. It was great. I love Ron, and I love this talk, and I'm very happy to share it with you. Tomorrow on the show, I'll have Dr. Jason Johnson and... Looks like I want to catch up with our friend Bill Boyle, Bill B in D.C., But now it's time to get to to some some of of the the news stories stories from from the last last 24 24 hours. hours. Just a few things I want to cover. I mentioned a couple of times this idea, this reaction to the midterm elections uh, to my guest today, Ron and San. I also mentioned it to Dr. Jason Johnson, who you'll hear tomorrow. But I read this guy, David Atkins. I just started following him at David O. Atkins on Twitter. He writes at Washington Monthly, American Prospect. He's a member of the DNC out in California. But he writes, I thought this is really good. I just want to read this quick thread to you on Twitter. He tweeted a big part of the freak out you've seen from Elon Musk and the rest of the right wing crowd is that they just ran a whole campaign against the whole, quote, woke mind virus and LGBTQ people in an electoral environment that should have favored them heavily. And they lost. They thought they had a big popular majority for, quote, anti woke. They did not. They lost. Elon is going anti-woke and going broke. All their right-wing startups are going belly up. They lost a Senate seat. And without a new illegal gerrymander, they would have lost the House as well. Normies is what he calls them, voted against them. Women were more fierce about Roe than they expected. Young people voted against them. They've lost the culture and they've lost faith in the electoral solutions to it. Who's going to save them? Trump 2024? DeSantis 2024? LOL. Tech is stacked in favor of the GOP. The Facebook groups, algorithms, and YouTube algorithms favor them. They dominate AM radio and cable news. Twitter was the most balanced and responsible. So Elon Musk bought it because the far right couldn't stomach even a hint of social responsibility. But they still lost. They lost the popular vote in 2016. They lost in 2018. They lost in 2020. They lost embarrassingly in 2022. They lost in Brazil. Putin lost in Ukraine. White Christian nationalism is failing. So they're taking desperate measures for control. As generational replacement continues and the failures of authoritarianism become more obvious, they'll lose even harder. 
The desperation for control will increase. Times will get more dangerous. But as long as the rest of society resists, we will win. The, quote, rest of society is what the far right calls, quote, the cathedral, as if it's some conspiracy. They see themselves as brave, rebellious resistance to it. But, of course, none of that's true. They're defending the hegemony of good old boy power. Meanwhile, the cathedral is no such thing. Creatives, the well-educated, scientists, real altruists, and curious all lean left. Young people are economically disadvantaged in lean left. The big problems like climate change do not have right-wing answers. And importantly, not even big corporations seem to lean left in now. Even big corporations seem to lean left in their public comms communications only because 18 to 45 years are the best target advertising demo. And guess where they live? what our values are, and how we vote. The Fox News audience isn't the target demo anymore. Too bad. So now you've got a coalition of theocrats with aging, declining followings and megalomaniac billionaires who think only dictatorship under their control will lead humanity into sci-fi future of their grandiose and self-serving delusions. But normal people aren't buying it, especially the vast majority of people under 45. They're going to lose. As for Twitter... Either Elon gets bored and makes it normal again, or he turns it into gab and destroys it as the people who actually provide value here move elsewhere. And regarding Elon's long-termism, no worries. Progressives and ethical science will get us to a sustainable sci-fi San Junipero future just fine. And we'll get there faster and more safely the more the Dunning-Kruger tyrants like Elon are sidelined from control over it. All right, I'm not going to lie to you. I don't know what he meant by that very last part, but the San Junipero and the Dunning-Kruger Elons. I mean, I, I kind of know what he means by that. But I think most of it was really optimistic. It's the most optimistic take I've heard, and it's as a result of the midterm elections. That's David O. Atkins. I will definitely try to get him on the show. And while I'm talking about Twitter, which apparently is still a thing, I'm still reading tweets from my favorite people and tweeting and engaging with folks. So it's it's still there and I'm I'm staying there. I'm not letting Elon Musk ruin it for me, no matter how much of a monster he becomes. Who who knows how many days, weeks it has left or if it's going to become something just pathetic. But I do think this is really funny while I'm talking about Twitter at Pope Hat tweets who is that at pope hat by the way who can tell do we know who's behind that twitter account anyway he or she tweets bear in mind that if the trolls and fascists have their way and dominate twitter and get normal people banned they're going to be miserable the same reasons that gab and getter and truth social are failures they want you here to troll you they're nothing without you i loved that tweet that analysis from at Pope hat. And I fully agree as sad as pathetic as that is. I realize that it's long past time. I do a segment with an expert on the protests in Iran. I read today that the niece of the Iranian Supreme leader, the Ayatollah Ali Khamenei is calling the niece of the Supreme leader. I mean, this is a big deal, but apparently she and the part of her family has been in opposition to him for decades. But still, the niece of the Supreme Leader seems like a pretty big deal. And she's calling on people to pressure their governments to cut ties with Tehran. So she's talking to telling foreign governments to cut their ties with the Iranian government over its violent suppression of anti-government protests. She made this video posted it online, and it's uh, a whole big thing and really fascinating and obviously very important. Long past time, I talked with somebody, so I'm making it my job to uh, find either Robin Wright or, or some other Iranian uh, expert. I've talked to many of them over the years to talk about this. The protests are now in their third month, and they've faced a brutal crackdown, Politico writes, by Iranian security forces using live ammunition, rubber bullets, and tear gas to suppress demonstrations. At least 451 people have been killed including 63 minors, according to Hirana, H-R-A-N-A. Another 18,000 people have been detained, the Rights Monitor reports. Despite the crackdown, the demonstrations are ongoing and scattered across cities, of course, unrest sparked by the death of a 22-year-old girl, Maza Amini, 
who is in police custody in Tehran, Iran, for violating the Islamic Republic's strict dress code. And today the plot thickens as the U.S. men take on the Iranian men in the uh, the World Cup first round. So they're in the same group, so they'll play each other. The winner, I think, advances. If the U.S. wins, I know they advance, but... Anyway, really interesting story there that continues to unfold, and I should definitely get somebody on to talk about it. Oh, and we've got some Fox News breaking breaking news alert from Fox News. Here's Fox News' Harris Faulkner breaking a really important story. And we have breaking news at this hour as Democrats in one area are bringing back masking just short of a mandate. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god it's crazy the uh, Demo- democrats are bringing back the masks yeah COVID's coming back i mean it didn't go anywhere it's it's a virus and it's going to continue and we should do everything we can to protect ourselves from it including getting vaccinated for both it and the flu by the way go get those shots Here's Anthony Fauci over the weekend talking to uh, the old Chuck Todd on Meet the Press on NBC. Is this country ready for another pandemic? And are we still in the one we have not uh, yeah. that we've been talking about? Well, we certainly are still in it. I think you just need to look at the numbers. We're still having between three and four hundred deaths per day. So I, I think the idea that forget it, this is over. It isn't. We're going into the winter right now. We have the wherewithal to mitigate against another surge. It's up to us to make sure that doesn't happen. And that's the thing that's very frustrating, Chuck, among public health officials, including including myself, we have an updated vaccine booster that we want to do. But the uptake of that is, is you know, less than 15 percent is some somewhere between 11 and 15 percent. We've got to do better than that. I mean, there's a few things you can do to protect yourself and you can wear an M95 mask, any mask, really it's better than nothing. And you can get vaccinated and you can try to be careful. And that's the best you can do. And if anybody's going to make fun of you for that or ridicule you for that, then uh, screw them is all I've got to say. Also wanted to mention that yesterday the president renewed his call for a ban on assault weapons following mass shootings at a Walmart in Virginia and an LGBTQ club nightclub in Colorado. Here he is. Looks like still on the island of Nantucket. I think he's visiting like a fire department. So we got a... One of the first red flag laws in the state of Delaware, my son Bo, was the one enforcing it. And it made a lot of difference. It saved lives. So that's number one. Number two, the idea, the idea we still allow semi automatic weapons to be purchased is sick. It's just sick. It has no, no social redeeming value. Zero. None. Not a single solitary rationale for it except profit for the gun manufacturer. Can you do anything about gun laws during the lame duck, sir? I'm going to try. What will you I'm, find to? I'm going to try to get rid of assault weapons. During the lame duck? I'm going to do it whenever i I got to make that assessment as I get in and start counting the votes. The president sounding passionate, sounding frustrated, sad, sounding indignant, and sounding lucid. Outside that fire department in, in Nantucket, I think he was he was still there. All right. Well, I've got a great conversation coming up for you with CNBC's Ron Insana. As I do with a lot of my guests, I just kind of hit record as he punches into the StreamYard video link. He was out in Los Angeles in a hotel, and we had a great conversation. And I just really like Ron. I've admired him for a long time. He's a brilliant guy. He's, he's nerdy with the numbers and with statistics and an excellent memory for all of it. He grew up working class in Buffalo, Western New York, not far from where I grew up in central New York. And he's been a finance reporter, an author, a hedge fund manager, and a regular senior analyst now and commentator at CNBC. He was the anchor of a show there at one point called Street Signs, which aired weekdays during stock market hours. He's done a lot in his career. He's accomplished a lot with, I think, as much integrity as you can have and still working in financial media, 
and the financial industry here in the United States, which is why I talk to guys like him and Red Holtz about these issues. He's great on Twitter, while that's still a thing, at Ron Insana. He's also a senior advisor over at Schroeder's, and now he's getting into the film and entertainment industry. He's producing a new film that is really sounds interesting. We talked a little bit about that, and uh, I just love this guy. I really like him a lot. I think he's smart. I think he's thoughtful and compassionate. I think he's really funny and works very hard. I think he's got a lot of empathy and an understanding of history and economics and obviously finance, capitalism, all of it. And he has had an interesting life as well, which is kind of where we start talking. He's on Twitter at R Insana. I think I said at Ron Insana. It's R Insana on Twitter, where he's great. Roninsana.com. Here we go. Media elite. I can hate that, man. I, you know, I grew up with no money. You know, Is that it's right? Like, it's, it's, yeah, it's such bullshit. You know, I went to a state school, paid my way through college, worked 20 hours a week, you know, and everybody thinks that when you get to a certain point, like you grew up that way. How did you, you know? grow up? And you grew up in Buffalo. I know that. Part of the time in Buffalo, yeah. And then part of the time in LA, uh, my dad did multiple jobs over the course of my life. Never made more than 35 grand. My mom was a Catholic school teacher. Wow. Oh. You know, went to Cal State Northridge for ninety dollars a semester when I started, three fifty when I graduated. Well, yeah. that's one big difference from then and now, and that even if you didn't have a lot, you could still go to college and not be in debt, right? Absolutely. At least yeah. in California, and I mean, I don't know about in, in New York. That seen. That if you use the SUNY schools, yeah, New Jersey, not so much because uh, Rutgers is really Rutgers, Montclair State, and the College of New Jersey (TCNJ) are the three publics. Um, but. Uh, you know, short of that, you're not getting much traction. I, you know, all my, well, two out of th- my three kids went to private college. My, my son's a music producer, so he bypassed college altogether. So, What was your big break? A buddy of mine from high school got me an entry-level job at Financial News Network because I couldn't get uh, any film work. <laughs> were you trying to be, what were you trying to do? I was a producer writer. I was a film major in college, and, uh, you know, it was, uh, nobody was hiring. Nobody cared. No one gave a shit. I wasn't connected, you know. I mean, so... We were running around dropping off resumes, couldn't get hired, and uh, got hired at FNN and, and stayed for 38 years. You know, now I'm making my first film ever. You are? In, uh, early next year, yeah. What are you making? What are you doing? Can I record uh, all this? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. It's, it's based on uh, a book called The Great Salad Oil Swindle, which in the wake of FTX and every other scandal we've gone through, in 1963, this gentleman by the name of Tino DeAngelis tried to corner the wor- world market in soy oil futures, and so... He leased out empty petroleum tanks in Bayonne, New Jersey, filled them with salt water, floated oil on the top, borrowed hundreds of millions of dollars from financial institutions, and the whole thing went bust third week in November 1963, four days before, in the four days before Kennedy got shot. So it was, it was one, it's one of the most deceptively simple scandals of all time. The guy just, you know, he'd been in the commodity business his whole life, really sketchy dude, and, you know, crashed the market. It was the biggest scandal since so, the 20s. So you've got a screenplay and you've you've sold yeah. this or you funding it? You're shooting it as a feature? A gentleman that I worked with uh, in, in my prior life at SAC when I was in the hedge fund business has got a theater screen and now content business that is uh, funding the film. I think we're going to shoot in February in Toronto and Hamilton and starting to cast right now. So. Is, is that why you're out there? No, I, I, I was, you know, I was trying to get a couple of meetings. I'm just finishing up some stuff for Schroeder's, but a couple of speeches, panels, and so on and so forth. And then after, you know, once uh, the end of the year rolls around, I'm, I'm reducing my exposure to some of the things that I do. And I'm going all in on film and television and a couple other businesses. Oh, that wow, I'm Ron, up. that's exciting. Congratulations. You're no, coming thanks. back to where you kind of started now that you've yeah. got all this experience and capital and resources and networks. That's very exciting. Wow. Yeah. And you know, I've only got so many years left, so I got to do it now or it's never going to happen. You know? Have you, uh, you know how many years you have left? I uh, no, but I mean, it depends. So it's somewhere like if, if I were just to base it between my mom and my dad, yeah. um, somewhere between 74 and 91, uh, is where they passed. Oh no, so, my, uh, I've got something here. It says not, not nearly that long. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was just uh, just You're before just this one movie. <laughs> no, just just before you you joined me, I was doing prep. Oh, okay, yeah, and so you, yeah, you you ran you ran the numbers. No, that's exciting. I just thought it was sure. funny the way you said the time I I have left. Do you think about life that way much? My friend yeah, has my friend heard world. this. Uh, shout out to to, to Dr. Zatz, who I hike with every Wednesday. He heard some podcasts. I forget he read a book where the guy had 
like a, a calendar of like all of the days that he has left or I something. <laughs> it's hard to be that precise. You know, I mean, but like I turned 61 in March and I, 60 was hard. I will say that 60 was hard. How, My wife how, how, how? Well, for the two weeks before, I mean, I was like, I was, I was pretty pissed. And my wife was, my wife's eight and a half years younger than I am. So she, at the time she was like 51 turning 52 or whatever. Ice. And she's like, yeah, it's just a number. And I'm like, yeah. And I had some um, expletives that were used in my uh, response, but I said, look, I'm as close to 80 as I am to 40. So when that, when, the, when you look at the timeline that way, you know, you start to go, okay, what do I want to do? Who do I want to do it with? Yeah. And, you know, and look, I could, my mom lived to be 91. Her dad lived to be 90. My grandmother on my dad's side lived to be 91. Yeah, I could have 30 years left, I would hope. Did you, know? you did, all your kids are out of the house, right? Uh, and not fully, but um, my, my oldest is, yeah. Um, my, mm-hmm. my son's 20. He's going back and forth to L.A. as a music producer. And then my little one's at uh, Davidson. She's a sophomore. So, you know, she still comes home. She's not out of the house, out of the house. Did, but... you, did you see that as a transition? When, oh, yeah. When they left, because I, I just kind of... I'm certainly not counting down the days. My daughters are senior and freshman in high school, and I, I, I love every second I have with them. But Absolutely. when I let my mind fantasize, I think about when they are both gone, I am too. Because I can't stay here in the house that I raised them in. I, I think it's, I have to transition too. And I'm, I, I wonder if, if you thought that way at all. Yeah, you know, we're having this conversation right now. Like, like All the kids like the house that we're in. And they want us to buy it. We've been renting it for a while because all my kids went to boarding school. So there was no point in owning a house, paying property taxes, and then sending my kids, to, which my wife did as well, you know, to, to boarding school. As a Sicilian American, you know, that's a little bit um, <laughs> far out of my, my line of thinking because we didn't leave the house till we were 30, married with children. Um, but, you know, the kids went and it was interesting. And there, there's, some, there's some really good things to boarding school in the sense that you're not kicking your kids, you know, in the behind every night to do homework. You're not having absurd arguments about this, that, and the other thing. And then when they come home, the times are generally better, you know, and, and, and they're getting through their stuff and you're getting through yours. But yeah, when they, when they were, as they now are closer to being completely out and we're very close to being empty nesters, they love this house that we're in in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey. They want us to buy it. They want us to stay. It's got, you know, a couple extra bedrooms in case they decide yeah. to pop by with their respectives. And, uh, you know, part of me just wants like, you know, something a little smaller, something a little more manageable. And, you know, and then my wife and I can just, you know, run around. You know, do you, when, when yeah, you say my wife and I can just run around. Do you foresee yourself retiring? Staying married? <laughs> <laughs> do you guys see yourself doing a lot no. of group uh, activity and <laughs> no, be I, more specific. <laughs> no, I think it's, if it's great, if you can have a happy marriage and, and, and in your older do, yeah. years and at quote healthy and normal, whatever you want to call it, my parents are almost 80 and they're still married almost, I guess, 52 years and, and so on. Well, my, my parents as, as Woody Allen once described it, uh, stayed together out of spite. So, you know, well, my parents um, are very much, I think, you know, they're happy. The point is, if you can do what they've gotten done, I think that's great. And, that, you know, but do you see yourself retiring? Not, no. quote, w- no, you'll always be, quote, working, even if it's. If I could do what other people are doing right now, and I see a lot of folks that I've, you know, kind of grown up with in my business work until they're 80. Yeah. And being productive and mentally active, which technically, as, as we understand it, wards off things like. Alzheimer's and other forms of, you know, degenerative diseases. Yeah. Listen, if I'm vibrant and healthy and I'm, and, and let's say I'm making movies, TV shows, or, you know, working in some sort of financial product that I want to create. Yeah. I could see going for at least God willing till 75 and then maybe, you know, slow it down a hair. But I, all my friends who are in their seventies, they're still going full bore. I'm working on a project with um, a famous comedy writer who's 72, 73, somewhere in that neighborhood. He's working more today than he's ever worked in his life. Can you say who that is? Uh, Alan Zweibel. Yeah. Oh, you're working with Zweibel? And Dave Barry. Yeah. Oh, my we'll gosh. What are you together. doing with them? They have a book that uh, came out in, uh, what, 2012 called Lunatics. And so I optioned the screenplay back from NBC Universal, and we're rewriting it, and we want to make it uh, kind of more current. Look uh, at but you. It's, it's a screamingly funny book. Look so, at you. Zweibel is one of the best people. And you, I, I've heard his name a few times this past year, and that's it. I'm reaching out when I'm done with you just to say <laughs> hi. He's such a great guy. He was so great to me. I love him. And he was he's such a funny and successful 
guy worked uh, with Letterman for forever. Yeah, and he's and he's got you know he has and he, look he's one of the original writers on Saturday Night Live. Yeah, you know he's he's worked with everybody. He's worked with yeah. Billy Crystal all the time. Everybody loves him. And and Dave's Dave I, I've never met of course, before. Dave Barry seventy five. Dave Barry and Dave's you know funny as hell. And oh yeah. There, there are a lot of people that I'm, you know, forged relationships with over the past couple of years, and we've been working together. And I've got a couple other projects in development um, with well, some younger guys. So. Why do people that work kind of in your business or tangentially in your business, let's say in investment in the financial world, I always just assume that a lot of them are advising other people on where to put their money so that yeah. they can blank. And usually it's pay for college retirement and so on. I feel like though a lot of finance guys, and I don't know, yeah. I'll, I guess I know a lot of them. They, they, I feel like they never retire. I feel like they just they continue working forever, and they have more money than than they they would ever need. But they must they must really like. I don't know. I feel like a lot yeah, of people. Yeah, I mean, work. look, it's you know, you're helping people meet certain needs and goals, and you know, the the question for me has always become retired to what? I'm not a golfer, right? right? I, mean, I mean, I I can play, and I suck. But you pick I mean, a ball, I, why don't you pick a ball? Well, I, yeah, I'm tired, and I'm I'm thinking about cornhole. Um, you should a cornhole. Lot. There's a whole televised. You should produce. <laughs> Combine all your passions. <laughs> yes. Produce a cornhole championship. Up, oh, my fake producer is telling me that's already on TV. <laughs> yes, it is. There's already, you know, when my niece and nephew, I, was, I have a uh, twin niece and nephew, and then they have an older brother, and we were down visiting them in either Atlanta or in Florida at my in laws' place, and they were out on the beach, and they're like, uh, "We're going to go cornhole," and I'm like, yeah. "Excuse me." <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it sounds really filthy. <laughs> well, I love, I mean, whenever, when, when I reach out to you to talk, which I could do every day and, and, and every right. week, I'm always like, it, I don't really have to have an agenda. I always have an agenda, but this has been really fun and fascinating. I don't know how much time you've got. Um, I'm, I'm good. I'm just sitting around in my hotel room. So all right. Well, I want to look through a few issues with you. Just drop my one F-bomb. I, if you, I, 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 I don't even remember it. when you said it. Did you say an F-bomb? Early on. Yeah. Uh, all right. I well, did. And, I'll you know, back. it's part of my normal vocabulary. It just... I'm shocked that in 38 years of television, I've never dropped one on the air. Uh, I don't even know. I, I, I appreciate your standard. I do. I'm not, I'm not, but it's like, I always, I guess everybody has standards, but the people that are most popular in the world, I found out yesterday, rudely, I decided <laughs> they're really seriously. Like I went on Twitter and I went down this weird rabbit hole. Cause I was, I was trying to follow this Nick Fuentes cat. Oh my God. To see, to see where know, he'd been and what he'd done. And he was on a YouTube show that was very, it had a, a lot of followers. And it was with these like young white guy and these two black guys. Like, what is this show? What is this show? I follow a couple more steps. Main dude uh, is white guy covered in tattoos. I watch him on Twitter interviewing these scantily clad women. Then they start having sex, which I didn't know you could have porn on Twitter. And then I looked uh, like maybe five more minutes went, going back to that show that Nick Fuentes is on. Porn stars and porn related people have massive followings. And I, I oh, guess yeah. I'm naive. I'm not saying I'm, I'm holier than thou or anything, but like their followings. And it just makes me, you know, as a comedian, commentator, whatever the hell I am, I'm like, I, I'm doing something wrong. I need to get into pornography <laughs> or at least OnlyFans. Yeah. Well, my, yeah, I, I wouldn't want to make anybody vomit um, immediately upon switching. There's got to be a, a lane for people like you and I. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that lane is. I'm man. saying um, it's a it's such a huge industry. It's so like uh, you know undercover. I will tell you that when I you know I start when I saw all this Nick Fuente stuff, and I, I am yeah. I'm having a very strong kind of violent internal. Where are reaction. you on anti-Semitism? Um, I, I am not an anti-Semite. Let's put <laughs> it that against, way. You're against. I'll put you down for against. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're anti-anti, right? Yes. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to keep <laughs> track of the anti-anti Trumpers, the anti-anti, you know, everything. Uh, look, I mean, I, I don't, I am at a loss to explain some of these folks who have cropped up lately and who have entered the, uh, let's call it the mainstream for lack of a better description, who literally preach hate. I mean, this kid, Nick Fuentes, I mean, I have some extremely strong feelings about this and were jail not an issue, some of these people will go away. You know what I mean? I, it, it, they're saying such <laughs> hateful horrible Nazi-esque 1930s oh. things, not just about Jews. I mean, you know, the attack on transgender, the attack on gay people, the attack on, you know, the misogyny that's all over the internet. I don't understand any of this. I mean, I've always been, I, you know, and, and when, you know, and you have to kind of learn this 
over the course of your life, depending on circumstances, just, you know, in your neighborhood where you grew up. Yeah. But I've been a live and let live guy my whole life. I don't really care what other people do, believe, you know, uh, engage in in the privacy of their own homes. And I, I don't understand the fear, the hatred, the um, violence that's that that's taken place. It's it's scaring the hell out of me. And, and it's, you know, some of these people who are now closely aligned with, you know, our elected representatives, this is a terrifying moment in, in my mind. Yeah, no doubt. I was going to ask you about your your thoughts and reactions to the midterm elections. So one thing I read and shared with uh, Dr. Jason Johnson on the show today, I want to ask you the same thing is a lot of, you know, smart analysts are saying they've gone so far, so extreme. That's why they lost the first midterm election. Yeah. You know, the opposite party with an incumbent president. Uh, like in 50 years, because they went way too far with abortion, with their hateful rhetoric, with their conspiracy theories, and there's just not enough of them. And young people are taking over, and yep. and it's just we, we see it as if it wasn't so dangerous every day, we see it as nonsense. These people are, are nonsensical. They're, they're posers. They're arguing in, in, in bad faith. They're trying to be famous. They're filled, but they're, they're dangerous. And well, they, and they have role models. I mean, you know, Sean Hannity is one of the dumbest guys that's ever, you know, you been think really? You think he's dumb. I oh, God. More. I, I, yeah, I've shared the stage with him once and, and, and I don't think he's that bright. Um, you know, Tucker, yeah. Tucker's got a nice education. Tucker. I don't, I don't know like what in his life has gone on that has created this hate machine. And I used to know Laura Ingram actually pretty well back in the days that we were both on IMIS a lot in the late nineties, early two thousands. And she was, I, you know, far more reasonable as a conservative. She has three adopted kids from outside the country and she's anti-immigration. This stuff just blows my mind. I yeah. mean, I don't know. I don't know what's going wrong in these people's personal well, lives. Isn't it just their showmen making millions of dollars? I, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, look, yeah, you're making 10 million a year or yeah. whatever. Or yeah. in Sean's case, 30 million a year. Yeah. You know, and and yeah, the crazier you power are, power and influence paid. and access and and money and it's yeah, but I, you know, and I guess no one, you know, I think and I don't want. I mean, I hate to be judgmental. It's not the way I live my life, but I mean, I guess if you don't have to sleep at night, you know, you take the money. My wife had asked me at one point if there was a network I would join uh, in the event that something went wrong with my current employment. And I said, "There's literally not enough money on the planet to get me to do that." Oh, really? Said, they could pay me a hundred million a year. I wouldn't go. I, I just well, I that's a sign it. of integrity. And I, I, I mean that I mean, like, that's it, I, I think part of the problem in media and media related, like we're, we're talking about people from Alex Jones, and Nick Fuentes, who have had to go independent because they've been deplatformed by every they would never be in a corporate media mm -hmm. outlet, although you could argue Tucker Carlson is is just as is dangerous at this point. But once you lose that job, and I'm sure, you know, a lot of people, I certainly do, who are at all the major news outlets who have lost their on-air jobs like you and i have had yep. and you still have and there's no more work for them there's right. it doesn't exist it's over the corporate media stuff is is on its way out and and that doesn't you know and media is so fragmented so once you when you got a great my point is when you have a great position in corporate media for however many more years you're going to do whatever it takes to play the role that is expected of you to keep that gig i I yeah, saw those forces top down. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, you know, with one particular institution, you know, there's a script, there are marching orders. I, I will say, you know, I know people don't believe this and, and you've been around uh, MSNBC. They may tilt left. There's no script. Right. I mean, nobody, no one has ever in my 31 years uh, being associated with NBC in any one of their platforms ever told me what to say. Hmm. Not ever. And if they did, I would have said the opposite and or quit. So it's like, you know, I've been in news meetings at the NBC level, at the MSNBC level, CNBC, affiliate stuff. I've done all of it at the, you know, at the firm across the course of my career. And there's never been a moment where somebody outlined an agenda to me that I had to carry yeah, out. But there's an unspoken agenda pretty much sure, everywhere that, that says I mean, if you go too far over here, over there, we just will either end your contract uh, quietly or we'll even more quietly. Just we won't renew you next time. You're just too yeah. you're too off the wall for us, Ron. Yeah, but off the wall, you know, I understand that. And like, look, when people start saying crazy things, there, yeah. there's a reason why you let them go. Yeah. I mean, you know, they're, they're saying crazy well, things. Well, Fox you know, News, that, let, that, I think that was the deal with Fox News, let Glenn Beck go because he got too crazy. But then, you know, that doesn't matter. Oh, it, it, it's gotten crazier since. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, Glenn. I'm, I Glenn. think that's what happened. I think that's what God happened. knows what happened. You yeah. know, I mean, he could have made demands that they weren't going to meet. And we, you know, you're never in those meetings. Right. I mean, uh, uh, unless you're in the room, you're not yeah, quite true, sure. True. Fair enough. Right. You know. Uh, so let's talk about uh, a little bit of that's, that's a conversation, I guess, about media. Uh, let's talk about the economy and 
first of all, you've been pretty consistent on cryptocurrency in terms of uh, ridiculing it uh, consistently. And now we've had this major event take place with SBX, STX, FBF, 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 FSB, whatever it is. Uh, <laughs> I, I hate that he gets to have three initials. I hate that a lot, most more than I hate cryptocurrency. I don't think anybody deserves that. And it's kind of pulled the curtain back. It's caused quite a panic, uh, although it seems that it's it's still a thing, still a form of currency. The markets and no. companies that are supporting it are still up. What what do you need to know for those of us who never wanted to learn about it and feel relieved that we don't have to learn about it and feel even more relieved that we never put any uh, of our money into it? And you've been fine. And listen, so the, the only thing that happens in these situations is, you know, early adopters can make a fortune, right? I mean, you, if, if you get in, you know, listen, when Bitcoin came out, it was at a penny to five cents or whatever. If you put $1,000 in at five cents and wrote it to $60,000, you would have had tens, if not hundreds of billions of dollars, right? Just, it would have been a crazy, you know, life altering trade that, you know, is inconceivable in most people's minds. It's never been a thing. It, it, and you and I have talked about this before. It is, it is a solution in search of a problem. <laughs> a lot of firms cropped up that were really just bucket shops that were, you know, kind of take the money and run type thing. They came up with some crazy ideas. Uh, the notion that it was going to supplant the dollar being at least at this juncture, the craziest, and that they created some sort of, you know, firmly established framework for an alternative money that it has no government interference, but has intrinsic value, unlike the dollar, which by the way is bullshit. But having said that, you know, they, and then they started doing things like yield farming and offer you 8% if you deposit your money here, there, or somewhere else. And that was done in ways that are, you know, dangerous, if not unsavory. Mm. And then FTX and a, <laughs> boast, and a bunch of others like Genesis, and, and I forgot who uh, just went bankrupt this morning. Uh, but they all blew up. And this is, you can see this coming a mile away. I, I've done this 38 years. Every scam that I've ever seen starts the same way. You know, it, there's a craziness and insanity, a, a, a speculative element to it that, that goes beyond the pale. It blows up. Some guys get rich early and then they kill everybody who's holding the bag at the end. Same story over and over and over again. Here's the uh, headline at the, at the New York po at the dumb New York post, but I like it. Crypto bros offloading G wagons, luxury cars amid FTX <laughs> crash. I'm just, I guess they're worried. <laughs> and look, I mean, you know, this this notion, this effective altruism that Sam Bankman fried was pushing, right? You make as much money as you possibly can and then give it all away. Well, at least according to what I'm reading, and I have to use the word alleged here so I don't get sued, he, he allegedly stole a fair amount because they financed <laughs> his property purchases with some of the money of the $420 million they sold to investors in, in a fundraise not too long ago. He took out $300 million. And he, at one point, he was worth over $20 billion, went to zero in a day. Um, that doesn't happen if you're running a, a, you know, a fundamentally sound business. Uh, are you criticizing? You're not criticizing the philosophy of effective altruism. You're criticizing the fact that he didn't actually practice it. Because I like yeah, effective it's, altruism. It's, it's, it's a cover. It was a cover for right. an alleged fraud. Okay. All right. Right. Just want yeah. to be clear. And like, I don't <laughs> effective altruism. I mean, there are lots of ways to go about you know helping other people, and it doesn't have to be you know involve these big crazy ideas. Like, I need to be worth a hundred billion dollars well, sure. so I can save the world. Right. You can go to a soup kitchen, you know, once a week and help people out. You can donate clothes. You can do. There's so much that people can do. In terms of do. donating specifically money, there's the money. idea. You need the, a lot of money to donate The idea money. that I think Peter Singer originated yeah. it and the organization GiveWell, which I used to work, you know, do their ads for them. Um, you know, the idea that giving money to a certain cause is probably going to do more good then another cause kind of right. thing, uh, right. charity I get it. I navigators mean, yeah. and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get that. And and look, yeah. I mean, there are a lot of wealthy people who could solve a host of problems if yes. they were so well, desired, let's, right? Let's talk about one. I decided today that Elon Musk is the new Donald Trump by one really important measure, which is when Trump was president and he was on Twitter and even before when he was on Twitter, basically, he, he was running the, the day every day. He's running our lives with his crazy tweets. Elon Musk is now similarly affecting our lives with his really wild stuff that he is saying, I mean, and and posting on Twitter. And yeah. more importantly, just that he's there running this app, which with all its flaws, many of us really, really love and is 
uh, made our lives. I don't know. I'll argue it's made my life better. Um, I can argue it's I made my life worse. Yet. I, I, I just, I've met so many great people through it. Yeah, it certainly helped absolutely. me promote my stuff in a way that I would never be able to do if, if, if these social media uh, outlets didn't exist. How am I supposed to promote my podcast out of my shed, put up a fucking sign? You know, I mean, like, so, I mean, and it's a lot, I could go on. <laughs> Just a, just a few people that enough people that listen in my neighborhood. Is that going to help me put my kids through college? Anyway, Elon Musk, you've been tweeting and saying a lot of things about him. You're great on Twitter. I love oh, following you. you on Twitter. And I think I see a lot of your tweets because I, I like a lot of your stuff. And so I think it feeds it to me. And so you, you have a lot of thoughts, I'm sure, about about him and his effect and Twitter in general. Go ahead. Anything you want to yeah, I mean, like, so Twitter is now, I mean, I'm at the point now where I get angry too early in the morning when I log on and, and, you know, it's like, I, I got TV going, I got my computer up, I'm getting ready to do some radio spots. So I'm reading in from seven to seven thirty, and I'm looking yeah. at Twitter and somebody says something hateful or stupid. And I, and I respond to what I deem stupid anyway. And I respond and, you know, my, 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 my stomach acid, you know, is, is, as at an unhealthy level by seven forty five AM every day. Um, I don't. I, yeah, I agree with you that 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 Musk is doing kind of the, the the Trump dance here, which is to just maintain uh, on a daily basis this this machine. You know, this hamster wheel is going every day, and um, I, I I don't know what his aim is. He's 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 confused me a lot, yeah. right? I, I you know, on the one hand, you look at him as as a genius who's done things that have not been done in the past by individuals gotten extremely wealthy in the process and then does things that undermine, I think his reputation as, as a business leader where, you know, he steps so far outside um, his lane, if you will, all he's got multiple lanes and, and gets into these just absurd conversations. Now, I don't know. I don't know if he's purposely stirring the pot to get Twitter engagement up so that the valuation <laughs> of $44 billion holds. Uh, he's lost 50% of his advertisers, according to some, estimates. Um, I don't know what he's doing. I, I don't get it. I, I like some of his free speech stuff. I think we all understand that free speech has comes with responsibility. And, and this notion that, you know, you could say, even when I tweet something and I, yeah. and if I decide that I want to call somebody a moron, it comes back to me and asks me to edit it. So yeah. Like, did I, you hear about the guy, by the way, free, free speech for whom, you know, the guy in the airport, I, I forget where it was, started uh, screaming that he's a Nazi and just got, all the security people took him out and he's like, you're, you're not letting me on the plane. You're violating my free speech. And I'm just like, people really, and, <laughs> yeah, and, and it's happening you're yeah. not getting on the plane, dude. <laughs> yeah. Like you don't have, like I'm, I'm for a lot of conformity on airplanes, uh, metal tubes yeah, yeah, same. flying same. through <laughs> the sky. I want everybody to be on the same page with so many obvious things. And even with like, you can know, you cannot play, a video game or watch something without headphones. Like, no, like right down to that. Yeah, yeah. So you definitely can't yeah. yell. I'm a Nazi. Let me on the plane. No, you're violating my free speech. No plane for you. No plane ride for you ever on any planes ever. Yeah. But this idea right. that people have about free speech, it's just so twisted that they can say anything they want anywhere they want. Anytime they want is not how it works. <laughs> no. And listen, I'll tell you, you know, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm a little older. I'm 61. So I'm older than you. Yeah, I'm 47. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm a lot older than you. Um, I could biologically be your father. I don't um, like how surprised you were when I actually told you my age. You're like, whoa, I'm a lot. <laughs> I thought because of your so, face listen, that I was, I was a little kid, right? I mean, like, and it wasn't just the things that you couldn't say as a little kid. There was a whole different set of operating principles. Like on, on July 4th, you know, we're waving the flag, right? And we're having a celebration. In my, when I was a kid, if a flag touched the ground, you had to burn it because it was desecrated, right? And this, this is like, and there were all kinds of, you talk about conformity. There were all kinds of rules in a community that you grew up in that everybody adhered to for the greater good of the community. Now, it's not to say my community was perfect. It was all white. You know, it was a Italian, Polish, Catholic community that was very, uh, to a certain extent, insular, you know, and so we were not an integrated town. But, you know, neighbors were neighbors. The The, 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 the degree of disparity in views was relatively narrow right to yeah. left. It wasn't that big of a deal. Um, it wasn't something to fight over. And, and yeah, and we knew, you know, having, having world war two depression era parents, you know, if somebody had claimed to be a Nazi in those days, 
you probably wouldn't see him again. You know, I mean, they yeah. could have been driven out of town yeah. on a rail. I mean, yeah. and all of this crazy stuff that's going on with, you know, the, the white supremacist group. This this kid, Nick Fuentes, really blows my mind, even more so maybe than a Ben Shapiro or um, a Tate. Why? Or, why? You know, I think I, I interrupted you when you were going to say stuff about him earlier. Why? What is he so? Why is he different? I, did, I mean, we're going to have the most racist, anti-Semitic, misogynist speech, you know, that anyone's ever heard. I mean, no. Absolutely not. You're not. There's no. Oh, form he said that. that. That's an, that's an yeah. actual quote that he said about yeah. he something about CPAC. Speech. Yeah. And he was and, and that, that those were, you know, that that's his calling card. Yeah. And I'm like, no, it's no, it's not. Yeah. You know, and in other cultures, man, you wouldn't be around very long, you know, uh, to, to, to go out there and say, listen, I'm just going to go preach hate. You know, and, and I, this is something that really I mean, this is kind of shaken me to my core because I've really never seen kind of wide acceptance for this type of behavior. Well, I mean, I, I, I still think that they're there. This is a kind of a death knell and we're going to see a lot of scary things and, and more violence targeted towards people because of the way they look or worship, yeah. et cetera. But it is also something that the larger society, certainly the, the younger generation, your kids, my kids seem to have a pretty good understanding as to what they perceive as okay or normal or, or, or illegal. I mean, obviously the Supreme court is living in a couple centuries ago, but a lot of Americans aren't. And yeah, the I, kids are pretty cool. I have to say, I mean, a lot of people dump on Gen Z. I, I, so I have three Gen Z kids. My oldest is about 20, turn 25. I got a 20 year old son, two girls, 25 and, and, and almost 20. And then my son's about to turn 21. And look, they, they, they are post-racial. I mean, I, I, I can't say that they don't notice differences among cultures. I can't honestly say that, you know, that goes unremarked upon or that they're not confused about pronouns or things like that on occasion where they're trying to kind of sort through everything that's coming at them by the same token, they could care less if somebody's black, white, Chinese, Jewish, whatever, they don't care as long as you know, they're, they're live and let live folks. And they are effectively appalled by everything that's going on yeah. and they all go out and vote. And that's what happened in the midterms, young people and women post Dobbs, we're out there voting in full force. Well, you got to they got the racial stuff, but you got all the gender stuff too, uh, and and yeah, and, and women's I mean, fast and furious, right? I mean, you yeah. know, so they're trying to process a lot of information as young people who they themselves aren't fully differentiated yet, right? Their their brains aren't wired till they're twenty five, so they they got a lot of information. They got a lot of change coming at them. I think maybe faster than other generations have. have oh, for seen sure. It. I mean, it, uh, without yeah. a doubt, you, you think they have more coming at them that, that, than, than we did or than our parents yeah. did. It's like, yeah. like 800 things a minute. I mean, I, mean it's, I, I am, I am from the single most boring generation in the history of generations. Right. I mean, I'm post Vietnam. Yeah. Um, I'm well, yeah. Post Vietnam in the sense that we had to register in 1979 for selective service, but we never got drafted. I was too old for Iraq. Right. So really, for all intents and purposes, the types of generational upheavals that other groups have had to go through, I never went through. Well, I mean, like I, I classify it as I mean, I'm in the same category, pretty much born in 75. But the the the, the pre-internet, pre-mobile phone era was was much different. Yet we did have some of modernity television, a lot yeah, of cable sure. television, a lot of TV. But there was this balance and we went outside and we we talked to people when we were in a room with people. We talked to them. We didn't stare into the phone. Well, I mean, like it's not their it's not their fault. If we had those phones, we'd no. have been the same. We'd have been the same way. That's why I think I don't like when people dump on our kids generation because it's like are you if we're gonna dump on anybody it should be our parents or or, or the boomers for setting yeah. our kids up for a, a pretty shitty situation by by a number of metrics and let me ask you about the economy and what's what's happening yeah. in the world first of all how closely are you paying attention to these protests in, in china i mean i i always pay close attention to protests i think it's uh, you know fascinating it's why i care so much about what happens in ukraine because i paid close attention to those young folks protesting and thrown out yep. the russian aligned leader that they had but i i at the same time it's like you, you get almost excited to see iranians protesting over women's you know d the gender equality stuff that everybody knows is happening there and then you get obviously it's, it's interesting to see what's happening in, in china as well with these protests and they're related to obviously the COVID lockdowns and, and those people seeing the rest of the world is at like the World Cup and living a quote normal life and they like can't go outside when <laughs> their their apartment building apparently was on fire. Uh, their worst nightmare. Well, so because they, they were they were cemented in. 
right? They were literally locked into their apartment really? with no with no exit. Oh yeah. my God! So what do you? I don't know how closely you're paying attention to that, but I mean, uh, we can we very, can drop. What'd you say? Very closely. I yeah. mean, look. I mean, and and look. Part of it, obviously is driven by economics. I mean, Dow was down 500 points today. Europe was down. Asia was down on, on the crackdown on the protesters, yeah. the spread of COVID in China, which is accelerating in certain parts of the country. Look, I, I, have, I have said for several years now that, that China reminds me of Japan in 1989, although there's an element of it that didn't exist in Japan, which is this, you know, one man, you know, cult of personality rule that, that President Xi has now successfully been able to to capture and and he is very much you know built in the mold of Mao Zedong and and so when you have this type of you know police state which is a in my mind an Orwellian surveillance state on steroids that is cracking down on any kind of dissent does not want any kind of freedom does not want the type of wealth accumulation that existed in the period when Deng Xiaoping opened the Chinese economy starting in 1989 you now have an environment that's going in the exact opposite direction, looks more like ch- communist China of the 60s and 70s that we grew up with. And I think, look, I think they're toast. I'll be honest with you. I really? think that they're not going to grow. They're, they're gonna, it's going to be a very stultifying, sclerotic system that won't change until this guy goes away. You're saying you think they're toast in terms of the Chinese economy is not going to be doing uh, growing at, at, at the kind of rates it has been growing as a result. They're not growing. Like They're not growing at all. A very, right. very interesting what's happening there and how it affects the entire rest of the world. And so let me ask you, I guess, about our economy and inflation worldwide inflation. Apparently, yeah. it's it's not the Democrats fault because it's everywhere. <laughs> Look, I mean, this is I, I, and, and again, like there, there, there's so many layers to this. There's so many competing opinions. And, you know, I can't you know, you want to stand around, clear your throat and go, hey, listen, I'm the only smart person in the room. I get it. I know why it's happening. The rest of you are completely full of shit. You know, you, you you can't do that for too much, for too long. But look, we had a pandemic I, that but, shut down the yeah, global Yeah, I wanted to try by saying <laughs> COVID. COVID, yeah. that's it. COVID. Yeah. It was COVID. COVID and the war in Ukraine. I don't know what else you need to know. Did we overstimulate? Well, we were placing enormous amounts of lost income during the pandemic, right? Yeah. The economy shut down for two full months. Zero activity, right? The economy contracted. 22 million people lost their jobs. The unemployment rate went to 14%. We were deflating. What cho- And listen, the Trump administration wisely doled out an awful lot of money in the form of direct compensation, loans, um, grants, all these types of things, because, you know, mom and pop businesses have two weeks of operating capital. Right. Right. And, and they're still gone. And then the war in Ukraine comes and that pushes up energy and food prices. And we responded by adding some more stimulus. The Federal Reserve had rates at zero, did things it had never done before. You can criticize that all you want. We didn't know what the arc of the pandemic was going to be. You know, we went, you know, to Delta, we went to Omicron. We still have multiple variables. I'm here in Los Angeles, which is having its own outbreak. You know, uh, nine out of 10 people now dying of COVID are over, I believe, 75. And so we're having, even if they're vaccinated, so we're having another outbreak where death death rates are going up in the United States. It's ripping through China. You know, no one to, to kind of like Monday morning quarterback this stuff and say, yeah. oh, you stimulated too much when the economy was in free fall. That's just nonsense. And so now the Fed's raising rates. They're kind of normalizing the situation. Economy is still reasonably strong. Unemployment rates, 3.7 percent. Black Friday, both in nominal terms and maybe even infl- inflation adjusted terms was pretty strong. People are spending money. We're going to go into a recession next year. The Fed's raised rates a lot. It happens, you know, and now they're they're unwinding the stimulus of, of, of this prior period. I think they're doing too much in that regard. I think if they just leave it well enough in the loan right here, inflation will fall because the, the dis- supply they disruptions. being the Fed. Yeah, they being the Fed, the supply disruptions we saw during the pandemic have been almost completely unwound. You know, the, the excess savings has been spent down. And so when you look forward, those same stimulants that were there and, and other complications like supply chain disruptions that were prevalent. You know, again, assuming China comes back online at some point, it's just not the same environment. And I think they should leave well enough alone. You know, real estate's in a very deep recession. And, you know, there's the, I'll put it this way. We're we're the best house in a bad neighborhood or the cleanest shirt in a dirty, dirty pile of laundry. However you want to describe the United States, whether it's inflation, whether it's growth, whether it's consumer spending, we're better off than almost every other country in the world right now. 
That's very, very interesting to hear you say. But when people hear the word recession, I think people think of the last recession that they went through. But all recessions, I am told, are different. And we you have a piece at CNBC about inflationary uh, rates and, and the effects in the 70s. All inflation is also apparently different but we don't know that we we i got ptsd uh from the last (laughs) time yeah i mean that's fair look the millennials have it worse than anybody right they've been screwed twice family formation after the great financial crisis they had a tough time getting out of the house and getting married and having kids so they went back to their parents basement pandemic comes along they're trying to get out again (laughs) yeah can't get out of the house they got to stay with their parents and then the housing prices spike and they get priced out of the market so you look at this stuff, you're like, there's, there, there is a cohort of, of, of younger people, you know, who wanted to go out and have children, you know, and, and, and form families. And it's just, it slowed that process down. Our population growth in 2021 was the slowest in the history of the United States. Is that right? So, yeah. So this is all, you know, all of this, it's complex stuff. And this is the first time in a while that we've had, I, I think, in many ways, um, challenges like these, maybe since the early 60s, Right or even early to late 60s, when things were really kind of rocky um, in a variety of different ways. And so life is cyclical. There is no permanent peace and prosperity. And I'm not trying to downplay the significance for individuals who suffer through these periods. But, you know, most every generation has something that they have to deal with. And we're in the middle of something right now. That's for damn sure. Uh, Before I let you go, how closely are you paying attention to how uh, government is investing in technologies and industries, specifically thinking about things like microchips, uh, much less antibiotics, things that the pandemic helped a lot of us realize that if we ever had something like that happen again, something yeah. similar, and we have to depend on China or anywhere else, Taiwan uh, or Ukraine, you know, a war, uh, then we're going to we're going to have problems. And so government passed legislation and spent more money, apparently, than they ever have. Uh, to invest in industries like the microchip industry and up uh, near where I grew up. I'm sure you probably heard about it. Uh, They landed a major, major microchip building company uh, contract uh, to build a giant factory up in central New York where I grew up. And and then yesterday, the New York Times had this really interesting piece about the Commerce Secretary, former Rhode Island Governor Gina Raimondo, who yeah, basically is in great, charge actually. of handing out a lot of this money to the different yeah. industries. And, and I just thought that'd be a really interesting thing to just ask you about what, what you're watching and, and seeing how government is investing and, you know, winners and losers and why we need to. I, I think you probably would think, I don't know, that we need to be uh, investing here at home in certain manufacturing, certain things, creating certain things here. Yeah, I mean, look, we globalized for a reason after World War II, right? Yeah. Now, it didn't include China at the time, but, you know, we became closer to the European Union. The European Union itself integrated. The notion behind all this being was that the more tightly bound together countries were economically, the less likely was the probability of massive destructive war, right? That's why you had the European community come together. That's why Europe unified was to keep Germany at bay so it wouldn't attack everybody again. And that their economic, you know, uh, future was entirely, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, dependent upon or interdependent upon what was going on in Europe. And we did that again with China in 2000. We tried to do it with Russia. They never wanted to play the game. And we've tried to do it with other parts of the world, right? Is how integrated could we become so that nobody wants to blow anybody else up? Because if you blow anybody else up, you're blowing yourself up, right? That's the the, the notion behind the Treaty of Rome in 1957. It's the notion be- behind the World Trade Organization, and all the rest of this stuff. Now, H.R. McMaster said something really interesting very early this year on CNBC. He said, we traded, and this is a, just the kind of you know, unintended consequence of that thinking, we traded supply chain security for supply chain efficiency. So <laughs> sure, China lifted a billion people out of poverty or however many, uh, you know, 400 million people out of poverty. Rest of the world got wealthy. Part of our country got poorer as we were leveling out after World War II when we were the only functioning economy in the years immediately after that war. Um, So we went through all this, right? And we globalized and we think it's a good thing. Some people are getting richer, some people coming out of poverty. And then we find out during the pandemic and and through other events that China is not a reliable partner. Now, had they opened up in a meaningful way, this could have come out, the outcome would have been different. Mm. But so we're we're dependent on them for advanced manufacturing inputs and so on and so forth. So now, yeah, now we're spending on on onshoring, friend shoring, finding countries that we can rely upon for supply chain uh, goods 
and services that we might require from other places that we can't make here. And we're going to invest a lot in the United States to reshore, onshore, a lot of those things that we, we put in other countries. And so we have, listen, well, the one thing we don't have right now is population growth, which we need. If we really wanted to blow this out and do it right, we, we actually need well, comprehensive immigration reform to bring more people in, right? Right. To, to right, make sure we can right. grow the economy in a meaningful way. As we bring, if you want to bring in more jobs, you also need more people. And we have still have, you know, we're still 5 million people short of the number of open jobs that we have in the United States. So we, we also need comprehensive immigration reform because millennials can't pop out 22 year olds at birth. Well, that's right? not, I mean, you know, that's <laughs> not happening anytime soon. No. And that's, that has become over social security and Medicare reform. Now immigration reform is the third rail of politics in the United States, which is insane because it's the way we've always grown. And it's such a fascinating issue to, to think about and to learn about that. There really aren't any special interests. So many of these issues are very divisive in terms of the state and, and, and federal spending and contracts and lobbyists, but there's, there really, you know, there isn't a special interest that doesn't want immigration. Uh, the classical yeah. Republican right wing interests overwhelmingly, the chambers of commerce of every state, the, the, the national, they all want it. Farmers, you know, want it. I mean, like, Valley in California. They can't get yeah. enough people. There's not yeah. enough construction uh, Whatever workers. kind of visa you're talking about, there's a job for yeah. you, it would seem. Yeah. And look, and, and this is this this one to me, in a certain sense, is, is almost the most mind blowing. Uh, you know, the other political craziness aside, because you look at the fact that we're short one point four million hospitality and leisure workers in the United wow. States. We're short three hundred and sixty thousand teachers. We're short nurses. We're short mm. doctors. We are short construction workers. Yeah. We're, we're short, you know, farm hands, if you will. There are eighty five thousand uh, H-1B visas, 450,000 applicants. Technology companies, even as they lay people off for specific reasons, are still asking, begging the government to let highly skilled people come in. And we know at the lower levels of the skill spectrum, we're also begging for people to come in. A friend of mine runs an Italian restaurant in New Jersey, paying $1,000 a week for dishwashers. Wow. Yeah, he can't get anybody. I mean, you know, so... How far <laughs> is it from my house? It, uh, it's in Inglewood Cliffs. It's right around the corner from CNBC. Man, I can get down there and wash some dishes. Place. Yeah, listen, I mean, it's if you want a moonlight, you know, for a couple I got hundred a, bucks a little, night, I need another you know? revenue stream. I hate washing <laughs> dishes. I would hate it. I'd last an hour, but like, I don't even like washing my own dishes as much as somebody else's. I, but, that is my job. But you make the point, and it's uh, the restaurants, uh, so many Doesn't other businesses, construction, yeah. w w what, is, what is going on with construction? We could talk about that uh, another time. Uh, we're, just, we're still sh we're short six million units relative to demand. Oh, wow. Look at you. He's got it all there at his fingertips. Dude, I could talk to you about anything and everything. Thank you for being so open and so interesting and, and thoughtful. Oh, and no, my point, I love doing this show, man. It's a great show. I really, really love talking to you, I, and I really appreciate you fitting me in today. And uh, let's do it again very soon, Ron. Thank I'm you. I'm around. Thanks. All right. There he goes. Ron and Sana. R and Sana on Twitter. We kept talking after I hit stop there and... I invited myself to the movie set with Ava, who wants to study film and get into filmmaking, give her a little taste of a film if it's, in fact, being shot in Toronto in uh, February. I'll be up there. I'll bring Ava up there, and we'll, we'll check it out. Great conversation with Ron. Really appreciate him joining me, and I think that's the best conversation I've ever had with him. We really connected, and he was vulnerable and open and thoughtful and brilliant, as always with his analysis and all things finance and economics, never pulls a punch. I really like the guy. I like the guy, and I like you. Thanks for listening to the show. Thank you for supporting the show with a paid subscription. If you're not, why aren't you? Let's go. Sign up now. It's the only way I'm able to make a living continuing to have these conversations with folks every day and working hard making it happen, booking the show, editing the show, posting and promoting the show. It's a lot each and every day. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your support because I love doing it. Not not complaining. Just telling you it's my job, and hopefully you'll sign up for a paid subscription. If you haven't already, you can always upgrade your subscription, pay more if you want, if you're getting a lot out of it, and it means more to you, and you got a little extra dough to throw around. Who does these days? But if you do, send it over to go to standupwithpete.com or patreon.com slash Pete Dombard. That's it. That's all I've got for you. John Carroll singing us out. Dr. Jason Johnson tomorrow. Meet me to watch the World Cup U.S.-Iran today at 2. If you're a subscriber, you'll get the link. If you're not into soccer, but you're just lonely, you want to hang out and 
joke around with us as we watch the soccer game and yell and scream and cheer and maybe uh, do drugs and alcohol, then sign up right now and join us. All right, bye-bye. Love you. Talk to you tomorrow. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of the day. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with the other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sin, they knew that change was going to come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up Alright, we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up You got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up